you know, this is a government that's reputed to be very high tempo, hardly takes any breaks, uh, the Prime Minister as well. Uh, you are in you know, one of the hottest seats in this government. Apart from reading and writing, I know you read a lot, I know you write a lot. Apart from that, do you get a lot of breaks? Do you take breaks? How do you unwind, we'd like to know? Breaks like, you mean, off days? Off days and to, to relax. What are you talking about, Shiv? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Uh, no, look, uh, I, I think uh, today there's so many things happening in the country and around the world that uh, even if somebody gave you an off day, you wouldn't take it, you know, because you'll have stuff to do, you'll be uh, involved uh, uh, in it. So, uh, I mean, I, I do all the things that normal people do, you know, I mean, I take a walk in the morning, I play some sports, I... He'll beat you at squash, uh, Shiv. Uh, He'll beat you at squash, Shiv, now. Yeah. What, 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 one last question, sir. We spoke of uh, the India way. The Mahabharat, I want to take you to Chinese military texts and texts and strategy. And I'm very curious to know from you, because if you read Chinese texts and strategy, they talk of, the warring kingdoms talk of two scenarios. One is a power that is rising, and I refer to modern day China, which believes its time has come and therefore starts asserting itself over neighboring kingdoms. The other is the most fatal mistake a power can make in its rise it believes it's risen sooner than it actually has. That leads it to make fatal errors. And I draw you now to what's happening between China and, say, India along the LAC, which leads to counterbalancing between uh, other kingdoms in the modern context, say, India, America, Australia, Japan, coming together as a counterbalance force against the rising superpower. When, and I want you to look now into the future and tell us 30, 40 years from now, would China have made the fatal mistake of the warring kingdoms of having believed that its time has come before it actually did? You only know that answer 30, 40 years from now. No, I look, I, I'd, uh, I mean, first of all, I, as India, I have a bigger uh, aspiration and frankly a bigger existence than be just counterbalanced to other people. Okay, I have my own interests and how I'm going to pursue it and uh, often that may lead me to make some decisions uh, which would uh, be in concert with others. In some cases it may not be. So uh, implicit in your question was, you know, we, we a, a kind of are you, are you part of a larger strategy of counterbalancing? I, I don't think that is the case. I, I think India, there is a rise of India. Okay, we are, I still argue, in the initial stages of a rise of India. But the rise of India may happen at a different speed, in a different dynamic, in a different nature. But I think 30, 40, 50 years from now, uh, people will look back and say, okay, these guys also did something phenomenal uh, uh, in, in their rise. Uh, so I wouldn't reduce, uh, you know, uh, ourselves to that. In terms of, you know, what China does as a historical proposition, I don't think it's just a China, you know, uh, in the Chinese history. I mean, I think it's a, uh, in fact, an example which is much more quoted is that of Germany. That, you know, could Germany, if, if you were to ask a hypothetical historical question, could Germany have Wilhelmine Germany handle the First World War uh, very differently? that you actually had what was the strongest power of its times, you know, which went and united a whole lot of other countries by their behavior. So there are examples. There are also examples of countries who have been very successful in managing the rise. The United States uh, is one. Uh, so, uh, you know, the beauty of history is you pick the examples you want to do. So eventually political science determines which part of history you like. So I would be a little cautious on that score. Very rarely do you have, as foreign affairs minister, a practitioner with whom you can have a deep conversation about Chinese military text or the, mid the warring kingdoms or even German military history. And that is just fantastic. And that's you know, really good for all of us as Indians to have, whether we agree or disagree with some of what you did, uh, but to have someone as accomplished as you at the wheel of India's foreign affairs. This is the first time you've come in real life uh, to an India Day conclave. You've shared some really sharp insights 
uh, with what's going on in your mind, how you're calibrating uh, India's foreign policy. And we deeply appreciate you having taken our time. Can we have a very warm round of applause for India's foreign affairs minister, Dr. Subramaniam Jai Shankar? It's been an absolute privilege and a pleasure listening to you over the last 45 minutes. Thank you, sir. India has always had to navigate a very complex neighborhood. But rarely before in time has our country had to face so many simultaneous global headwinds. From the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan to the PLA's military buildup along the line of actual control, the geostrategic risks to India are clear and present. The man responsible for charting the course of India's foreign affairs through these turbulent waters is a longtime practitioner in the fine art of diplomacy, considered by many in the foreign services as the finest of his generation, Dr. Jay Shankar now has that rare opportunity to shape policy in his area of professional expertise. It's that sweet spot that lacks of professionals dream about, but only the chosen few get to practice. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming for his conclave debut in New Delhi, the External Affairs Minister of India, Dr. Subramaniam Jai Shankar. Can we have a warm round of applause, please? <laughs> Joining me for this interaction are India Today's Foreign Affairs Editor, Geeta Mohan, and Executive Editor of India Today Television, Shiva Roo. Dr. Jai Shankar, welcome. Let me start by asking you about your reading of the current situation in Afghanistan. There have been lots of reports about the Baradar faction and the Haqqani faction being at loggerheads. How are you working towards recalibrating India's relationship with the new Afghanistan in light of the reality of the Taliban takeover in Kabul? Dr. Jay Shankar. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Rahul. It's good to be with all of you today. Uh, look, the situation in Afghanistan is still unfolding there is still a lot of lack of clarity, I and mean, obviously some of the more visible changes are, are apparent. So uh, you have to make your, take your positions, make your decisions on the basis of what you have. Now, the general sense in the international community is that uh, there are some basic expectations which the world has of Afghanistan. Uh, the most basic of them is actually the fact that Afghan soil will not be used for terrorism uh, against other countries. Uh, uh, there are uh, also expectations about the nature of the government, that it would be uh, inclusive in some form. Uh, that, uh, you know, uh, there, there's, uh, there's a view about uh, what are considered uh, governance standards in this day and age. Uh, so, uh, question of, uh, uh, you know, how you deal with uh, minorities, with women, with children, uh, how you deal with uh, people who want to leave your car, you know, go out of your country or come into your country, I mean, legitimate uh, moment. So, I think these are all uh, live issues and uh, um, we are obviously quite involved in uh, shaping the uh, thinking of the international community on that. Uh, partly because we also happen to be at this time a UN Security Council member. Many of these debates are taking place there. Some of them are taking place in the G20 format. We had a foreign ministers meeting of the G20. Uh, so I think it's, so, you know, it's evolving. We are making it up, obviously responding to the situation uh, as, as you uh, go along, but uh, uh, beyond that, it's hard to take a very